Hello and welcome. My name's Manisha Tank and it's my honour and pleasure to host this special live telecast. In fact, it's interactive as well on behalf of Standard Chartered Bank. We are talking today about global supply chains, trends and tremors. It's our big subject and we're going to be joined by two absolute experts to talk about this. So, of course, you've been seeing it across your news headlines on your TV feeds. You've been hearing about it on the radio, reading about it on the internet as well. Empty supermarkets, factory shutdowns, you'll be familiar with these images which are all over the media. We've had fear, we've had irrationality, stringent lockdowns in a number of European countries, for example, and right here in the Asia Pacific as well, of course, the big lockdowns in China. It is an unprecedented situation with COVID-19, the global pandemic, and it's leading to conversations, serious conversations about the possibility of a global recession. Multinational companies are weighing in, as are the governments and central banks are taking action. So it would be easy to blame a virus for all of this and what it's doing to disrupting supply chains. But actually, you could argue that the creaks in these chains go back a little bit further than that. And we've been talking about the need to update and get with the 21st century for a while. This pandemic that's been fueling fear the world over has created a bit of an inflection point for us, hasn't it? We find ourselves able to ask some really important questions about what we're learning through this pandemic and how we can apply it in the future. How can we leverage technology? technology, for example, what changes need to be made, what changes were already being made. So I said that we had a couple of experts with us to discuss this. Let me introduce them to you now. We have Samuel Matthew, who is the head of documentary trade at Standard Chartered Bank. Sam, good to see you. Hello, Manisha. And Parag Khanna, who is a friend we've spoken a few times and author of The Future is Asian and Connectography, which is pretty much about the subject, right? <laughs> Thank you, Manisha. Good to see you both. Now, uh, gents, if you just hold tight, I'm going to run through some of our housekeeping issues today. So the first thing I want all of you watching right now to know is that we are running live Q&A. So that means you can send your questions in to us. We already have a few from some of you who have registered, and we will be bringing those into the conversation, which is great. So on your screens, it's to our left, to your right, you will be seeing those questions come up, and we will be picking them out as we go along. Also, we are running live polls, and we're going to get to the, one of those in just a moment, but do join in with those polls. We will put them up, and then you can see the results come in, and they address some of the big questions around supply chain disruption and our subject today. At the end of the session, we would love for you to provide some feedback, so you can do that. Uh, there is an icon, a feedback icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to click on that and then provide your feedback. And there will be a recording of this live session. You can check that out later in case you've missed anything, um, but hopefully you'll be paying attention and you will hear everything that we have to talk about. So I did promise that we would look at one of those polls, and the first one, and we will see the answers in real time shortly, uh, is around your top supply chain priorities. So we posed the question, which is your top supply chain priority within the next 12 months? Uh, is it delivering cost savings? Could it be B, improving working capital? C, risk management, or D, supply chain digitization, or E, supply chain sustainability. Now, while we wait for some of the results of those to come through, uh, gents, like in a sentence, what would you say if you were asked that question, Sam? I would say it's sustainability in the current context. Okay. With all the disruption going on, I think it's diversity and long-term long sustainability for me as a as somebody who will be procuring and selling today. Okay, I know we're going to get to that later. <laughs> Parag, what would you say? I mean, given the circumstances we're in right now, probably risk management, because what we've seen over the last few years, although there has been a broader awakening that one should have a better mapping of one's supply chain, we know that not enough firms have done it. Right. And therefore, they are caught out right now not having prepared for that and having too many eggs in one basket being over concentrated in certain places. That's been exposed right now. So unwinding that, sorting that out, managing that risk is priority number one. Okay, you guys took liberties. You took more than a sentence, but it's all right, I'll forgive <laughs> you. So there we go. We've got uh, some of the results coming through now. And, and what do you make of that, Sam? Hmm, looks like I was more or less right, or at least uh, 40 plus percent of the people agree with what I'm saying. So. It's, it's a hard choice, um, Manisha, uh, it's, it's a trade-off, and I think a lot of these parameters, including risk management, are important. But I think one key thing, if I were to pick up one, would be sustainability on my mind. Okay, all right, we'll dig into that a little yeah. bit later. But otherwise, uh, thanks to everyone who's taken part in that poll. We will be doing more polls as the session goes on. So let's kick off. Sam, um, you know, Standard Chartered Bank is behind all of this, and it would be really interesting for us to hear a little bit more about what clients are saying to you and where you stand on the supply chain disruption. 
Right. Uh, thanks, Manisha. Um, first off, let me just say that for all of us here, people on the call, uh, people uh, watching us, I hope we are all safe and our families and loved ones are safe. Uh, and for those clients on the call uh, watching this, um, we are doing whatever we can as Standard Chartered Bank in all the 60 markets we operate in to support you in your business. And uh, if you need to know more, please reach out to us to our, uh, at our lo local Standard Chartered contacts uh, to help you with whatever BCP situations and uh, processes we have set in place. Um, webcasts and teleworking is, is be becoming a norm. Uh, so let's kick this one off. Uh, I wanted to start with three points, if I may. Uh, one is I think we are living in a very, very hyper-connected world. Uh, the rise of China as a production factory of the world, the rise of the Asian tiger economies, globalization of the last few decades has resulted in supply chains that are very, very complex, very, very long. If I were to take one example of that, if you think about an Airbus A380, um, I'm told it, 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 it has about 4 million parts coming from 1,500 suppliers across 30 markets. That's the kind of complexity we are talking about, right? Um, and it's only going to increase. Uh, it has already increased over the years. So that's one. Two, um, I would want to talk about disruption. So even before we had COVID-19, the world was moving towards more right-wing, protectionist, nationalist uh, movements and rhetoric. Uh, we saw that with the uh, Sino-US uh, trade war. We saw that with Brexit. Um, and already with the Sino-US trade war, uh, we have seen our clients starting to load balance a little bit with, between China and some of the uh, other markets, especially in ASEAN. Specific uh, sectors, if I were to take textiles, apparel, footwear. We have seen a, a little bit of the spillover happening into, from China into countries like Vietnam, um, Bangladesh, etc. cetera. Um, and with COVID-19, it has only, I would say, uh, exacerbated the situation where clients really need to think about uh, resilience, and long-term sustainability of their supply chains, right? All the more. The third, I would say, is um, third point I wanted to make is about technology and automation. Now, there are a lot of supply chain platforms out there, and clients have been integrating this uh, to bring visibility into the deep end of the chain, right? With uh, with platforms providing integration of data across people, processes, and and systems, right down to the, maybe the second-tier suppliers. Now, all of that with technologies like artificial intelligence, you can drive a lot of insights into what is the supply quality, what is its performance, what are the optimal shipping routes, uh, how do you bring costs down. But I think uh, one of the things we need to start thinking about is supply uh, chain agility. So if you uh, look at what has happened recently with, because of the situation we are in, there's a shortage of masks and uh, hand sanitizers and ventilators. And we have seen auto companies like uh, BYD and Tesla and L'Oreal for example, coming up saying they're going to repurpose the, their chains to, uh, to fill this gap in. So I think longer term, uh, it's a very interesting uh, situation we are seeing where it's not just about diversification. You also need to think about, probably think about supply chain as a strategic differentiator and think about supply chain agility. Yeah, I, th I think it's a remarkable thing when you have the parent company of Gucci saying that Gucci will start providing face masks. It's something <laughs> different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely a sign of the times. Parag, um, in the follow-up to that, you've been saying for some time that things needed to change and are changing. Right. Absolutely. And let me first echo what Sam said at the beginning. This is an unprecedented time. Only the oldest human beings alive today could possibly relate to a crisis of this magnitude. And we're thinking, of course, of the Depression and World War II. Um, you know, I think at a historical scale, uh, when I saw the, the crisis and the epicenters leap from China also to Iran and to Italy, my mind shifted to the 14th century, to the Black Death. And what was so interesting about that period, it played out over years, of course, with far greater casualties you know, than, than we're seeing today, fortunately. Um, but what that did was to fragment the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire was the largest, vastest territorial empire in human history. Now, that geography tracks today's Belt and Road Initiative, as we know, Iran, Italy being two countries that are anchors of that. And I'm thinking about the future of supply chains from the lens of their geopolitical nature and thinking about how now a lot of companies and firms are going to be saying, we've had too many eggs in the China basket. We are too dependent on China for critical technologies, the medical devices that Sam mentioned, of course, pharmaceutical supplies as well. And what began actually 10 years ago, not just with the US-China trade war, not just because of the pandemic, what began 10 years ago was a shift of supply chain concentration out of uh, China, which is to the good. If we can just pull up slide number one, 
that shows really the geographies and the waves of Asian growth. Starting, of course, with Japan in the post-war decades, followed by the tiger economies. Then China becomes the factory floor of the world. But ever since uh, Chinese wages started rising, ASEAN wages much lower. Then you actually had Japan very concerned about its geopolitical tensions with China and massively shifting FDI out of China into ASEAN and as far as India. Then, you, of course, you had the rise of the ASEAN markets and South Asia as well, their growth, trade integration happening. Then came the trade war. Right? And now the virus. So you've had five or six significant milestones in the last decade that have all pointed to this fourth wave of growth economy, South and Southeast Asia, which, by the way, is a good two and a half billion people, right? Uh, almost all of them poorer than Chinese uh, people, lower wages, younger median age as well, drawing that investment in. So we've been well into this fourth wave of growth, and it is going to be critical for supply chain diversification to leverage uh, these markets. And as Sam said, we've had... Uh, smart companies starting to uh, you know, broaden uh, their supply chain footprint. To give a couple of examples uh, to add to what you were saying, uh, South Korea, Samsung phones are almost entirely made in Vietnam now and in uh, South Korea as well. But the South Korean component, because their factories have been hurt by the virus, have shifted even more production to Vietnam, for example. So in addition to the footwear and the apparel, you've got the electronics. If you can just go to the next slide, you get a sense of how rapidly ASEAN has been catching up in FDI, almost now, it's about 50 billion behind where China is, 200 billion of FDI into China, 150 into the ASEAN economies now, but growing very, very uh, strong. So I expect that actually, if you look medium term, long term, as difficult as that is to do right now, uh, the momentum rests with Southeast Asia and its ability to attract those supply chains so we have more, more diversification. Yeah, you can see it very clearly in the graph. Um, and also, I want to move it on to you know, you've given us both the sort of outline of where we stand mm -hmm. in a more macro sense. But let's talk about what's happening right now and what is the, the big change, the big shift that we're seeing, or what are the people telling you about the impact of COVID-19 in the here and now? So, uh, you know, if you were to take a step back, Manisha, and look at what happened with COVID-19, it started as a, a contained impact, or at least from a geography perspective, in, in Wuhan and Hubei. Now, Wuhan is a very, very big manufacturing um, uh, base, uh, particularly for auto, but there are some other industries in there. So you would have seen an immediate impact in terms of auto, and I think, Parag, you mentioned the impact on some of the auto names, Korean plants, uh, Japanese plants being impacted. Um, but there on it, so it started as a supply shock, right? The components couldn't get out of China uh, soon enough. But then as it spread to, the, to Europe and, and to other parts of the world, now we're dealing with a global pandemic, and lockdowns happening in most markets, you're now seeing a demand shock. So this is unprecedented. I've not seen it in my lifetime where you have a supply shock and a demand shock to the system. So sub, uh, the supply chains are gonna be really, really stretched. But if you were to then take um, an example of, yes, there is a lockdown, but if I look at retail uh, or uh, let's say groceries, um, there'll be some groceries that you really need to stock up on, right? The staples, the rice, the, the, the milk, the, uh, the, the bread. Um, but not everything in the supermarket shelf is going to be as important to even in a lockdown situation. So it is, it is about taking away your supply chain, your demand forecasting tools that you would have done on a regular monthly, weekly perspective and see how you can translate that into more clinical forecasting for your suppliers. Your, supply chain may, your suppliers may come back on, but you may have a demand shock if you don't accurately forecast uh, you know, uh, what, what are the key components that you now need to keep it going? Well, I want to jump in there just because we've actually had a question on this. How are global retailers and CPGs responding to the supply shortages? So I appreciate that you're saying this is a demand and supply shock, but how yeah. is that response manifesting? So, well, look, if you have not diversified at all because of the historical reasons, because many of them had started uh, diversifying. Um, so if you, have, if you have already diversified, you have option A, B, C, D, it's about ramping up some of the other supply sites that have not been as impacted. And, and, and mind you, China is starting to come on, uh, back on stream now, right? China, uh, yesterday we had no cases uh, or very little cases in China. We are hearing that the factories are coming back on stream. So your supply shock, at least from a China perspective, should be now uh, less, uh, I would say, uh, impacted. Um, so if you have options and if you have a, a good autom automated system, you can easily switch between supplier A, B, C. But if you have not done that in the past, I think that would be a challenge. Now, in this current context, look for new alternative pieces of supply. All you can really do is forecast demand in a more clinical fashion 
um, throw away the monthly, weekly forecasting you've had. Try and look at which other things you really need because if you're a retailer and you're relying purely on footfall in your, in your malls, you'll, you'll struggle right at this point. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, that, that's where it links to your business strategy. Did you really have an online strategy? If not, you're gonna struggle. If you had an online strategy, people are gonna buy online. In fact, the e-commerce order seems to have gone up from what we pick up. So it's a matter of understanding based on that data, which are the products you need to probably uh, order more. Well, it's often said, and maybe I got this wrong, but it's often said that Alibaba was born out of the SARS crisis. You know, there was this big switch yep. and an opportunity um, to innovate and move to a different platform. Barag, as you look at the current situation, and let's just talk about COVID-19, what is the biggest vulnerability that it has helped us see? Well, a number of things. Obviously, we're talking about the supply chain concentration being one vulnerability. And again, not only firms, but entire countries have to think about this now from a macro national standpoint of their resilience, their resources, whether it is energy. Fortunately, we're at a time of low energy prices. So despite the economic impact that this pandemic is having, it's not going to create the kind of balance of payments, uh, you know, sort of sort of dynamic or problem that happens when you have high oil prices and, um, you know, and, and a big hit to your economy. In fact, we should talk about this resilience resilience issue from a macroeconomic and national standpoint, because there are very recent precedents to our, to our concern about Asian markets and their ability to handle these kinds of uh, situations. One is think about the taper tantrum, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just a few years ago, when you know most debt was still denominated in US dollars, we were worried about rising interest rates, which again, another thing we're not worried about anymore at this this point in time. But most Asian countries, the emerging markets, ASEAN countries, have most of their uh, debt in local currency. So that's not uh, an issue right now. Then again, with the trade war, right? A big concern that, well, this is a, a demand shock, and therefore that's going to hit uh, Asian economies uh, very hard. So from the financial crisis to the trade war, there were concerns about this. However, what we've seen, we can just pull up the next slide. You'll see there is what, we, what has changed in the last 10 years is that Asia as a whole represents 50% now of global GDP. And what you're seeing here is actually the national is GDP in purchasing power parity terms. So the answer in both, uh, not quite the taper tantrum case, but certainly when it comes to the trade war, and now with the pandemic, is that those countries that have large domestic consumer bases and diversified economies in production are going to be able to rebound from to this crisis uh, better in the same way that they've been also able to better respond to things like uh, the trade war. So again, there's a little bit of continuity here in what constitutes resilience at a national level, having your local currency debt, having a large domestic consumer base, and so forth. So we want to, you know, if we're thinking about the medium term, thinking about which economies are going to come out of this fastest, it's going to be obviously the larger uh, bubbles here. And Asia has quite a few of them, which is, you know, a heartening sign. Yeah. Can I add a, sure. a, one more attribute to that? I think, I think we, the other thing we probably need to think about is demographics. Yeah. So uh, the, the proportion of young population below 30s or below 35s, yeah. mm -hmm. if you look at that in the Asian context compared to some of the other markets, and, and even Africa has a young population, mm -hmm. I think both from a consumption perspective, but also from a sheer labor force available to uh, set up the supply chains yes. and contribute to the supply yeah. chains, I think that would be a very important factor to Huge. consider. Huge. And, well. you know, I mentioned that all of the fourth wave of Asian growth countries, South and Southeast Asia, from Pakistan through India, Bangladesh, all of ASEAN, except for Thailand, the mm -hmm. only outlier is Thailand whose median age is almost the same as China's, every country um, is younger, sometimes 10, 12 years younger in median age than China is. So this is an enormous source of resilience. So you've talked about resilience, you've talked about diversification though as well. And now you've talked about the resilience. I, I wonder what the, the answer to the question will be. Will this COVID-19 crisis spark a deglobalization event or not? Um, I don't worry about that. Okay. So on the one hand, you know, sticking with this uh, map here, with this infographic, what you see is clearly the world is already very regional. Right. In fact, again, before the pandemic, uh, because of the trade war, North, the United States was trading more with Canada and Mexico than with China. Right. And so you had a, a little bit about 330 billion with Mexico, 310 billion with Canada and a little bit lower with with China. So you had that North American regionalism. Europe has always led the way. 70 percent of European trade is internal. Asia's is 60 percent already. 
right? And that's, that builds on trends that go back to the Asian financial crisis and the rebound from that and the trade integration that's been happening. So you have this regionalization of the world economy that's already been taking place, a tri-polar, tri-regional global economic order. We are already in that world. But you can clearly see that uh, if you move to the next uh, slide, um, look at China's sort of you know, tentacles, right? Uh, this is actually a map from 2016, still exactly accurate. China is the number one trading partner for 124 nations, more than twice as many as the United States is. And we're seeing every day, obviously, the dependency, again, that countries have on the very specific categories of goods, especially in the medical devices and so forth. So deglobalization, of course not. You know, not in energy. So I mean, North America, yes, because of the shale revolution. But a lot of countries are still energy importers as their economies grow for goods and services. And then the digital economy, obviously, ramping up tremendously. Right? You know, look at Netflix, WebEx, Zoom, right? Spotify. So. It is far too simple to talk about deglobalization, to pick one narrow aspect of international integration and say that it's all being ripped up. On the whole, we still have a lot of globalization, yeah. positive globalization. I'm not going to suggest for a second, Parag, that you're not on the front lines, but you know, you get to take the academic view, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> what about you? Because I feel like you're the front line man. Yeah. <laughs> what do you see in so more look, pragmatic uh, ways? I do agree with Parag okay. uh, in, in a nutshell. Um, what we are seeing from um, clients and hearing uh, from the industry, and I, I especially like the digital point he was making, so all of us consume Netflix, Spotify, you name it. I think that gig economy, that digital economy is being consumed on a global basis. It's produced in, content is produced globally, um, and the platform is global, and consumption happens globally as well. So I think global supply chains in the digital context is definitely here to stay. Uh, and and I, I can't see deglobalization happening there. Content could be local, but consumption will, will remain uh, global. In, on the physical goods and services, I think you, the world will see more regional trading blocks. Uh, with the failure of um, TPP and more regional um, trade agreements happening, you may see uh, more regional trading blocks happening. And to your early point, therefore, about China, and uh, we, we had seen a study where um, it was, uh, in fact, Sanchez's own research shows that the regional south-south trade um, is going to grow at a much faster pace than mm -hmm. really north-south trade, right? So uh, I think more regional trading blocks, uh, that does not mean deglobalization, it's just that it's going to be more regional flows right. happening. Another point on this, if I may, I mean, the, the trade within the broader Indian Ocean region, right, mm -hmm. where, you know, Stan Chart is extremely well represented, that has been the fast, those are the fastest vectors of trade growth in the world. Now you have the regional comprehensive economic partnership with mo most countries, with the exception of uh, India, you yeah. know, uh, ratified. And in terms of TPP, again, other than the U.S., other yeah. countries are moving forward. But I think that the Asian region as a whole is well poised to benefit from the internal complementarities. Uh, again, you've already got the supply chain shifts towards cheaper uh, production centers. China itself has been very active in offshoring uh, out of its own country. You mentioned textiles is a very yeah. good example of that. So the internal regional you know, fungibility of supply chains is a very positive uh, dynamic. And again, if we can go to the next uh, slide there, we'll see there that you know, uh, the China trades more with ASEAN yeah. than with the United States at this point. You know, again, most people outside of Asia don't know who the members of ASEAN are. And yet, this sub-region, Southeast Asia, is China's is a larger trading partner of China. And what China has been doing since the trade war, and also due to Belt and Road, let's remember, these are all things that predate the pandemic. Let's, let's emphasize that, right? The last five years, China has been saying tariffs will come down for everyone except the US, right? So you also have China moving into a almost net deficit position on trade because it's hugely importing more and more. And with RCEP, this is the critical point to build on what we were saying already, um, firms will benefit from locating their supply chains in the lower labor cost markets of ASEAN and then exporting back into China. China. So we're going to see tremendous deepening of pan-Asian growth Okay. trade. Um, I want to dig into you know, what companies right now should actually be doing. We're going to do that in just a second. But to pick up on the point you were just making, Parag, we've actually had a question, quite an interesting one, which goes along that theme, which is how would China defend its dominant position uh, in the mid to long term? What do you think? So some of these things they've been doing already, one is there are still non-tariff barriers that are quite strong in China. We know what Chinese industrial policy looks like. We know how they you know, uh, force technology transfer, the joint ventures. They've come up with novel ways of getting some of the high-tech 
you know, Western multinationals continue to do joint ventures with them. We've seen this in the technology space with uh, Qualcomm and Intel and others who still deeply want to be in China and operating in China because it is such a large market for them. So they're still caving in, if you will. The other is automation, right? And we have to talk about this for sure because this is, again, something that is exogenous and prior to the pandemic, right? China, despite the aging labor force, has managed to keep exports very strong, output very strong, manufacturing strong. Why? Because they're automating, right? And if you look at robots per you know, worker and so forth, obviously Korea is higher than, and Germany is higher than other countries, but China is, gonna, is catching up very, very quickly. So automation is one part of the answer. And it's important in this, in this context of the pandemic as well, interestingly, and this may be a bit sad in the sense that if you think about what South Korea is on, Hyundai. Mm -hmm. Hyundai had the double whammy. Dependent on Wuhan in particular for automobile part uh, imports, intermediate uh, uh, components uh, for its production, but then had a factory shut down because of the virus. So coming out of this, you're going to have countries like South Korea that, again, are so highly automated already, saying we need to automate more because we need to start to produce more of the components domestically and we have to be less dependent on human labor. So automation is an answer to a number of these challenges for different reasons in quite a few economies. Yeah, and that then throws up employment challenges for governments, but yes. you know that might be one for another telecast. Um, let's just take a moment then before we switch gears and we start talking about what we can do and how we tool up for the future uh, to run another one of our polls. So. This is our second poll now. Is your company planning to diversify your sourcing in the next 12 months? So you've got a couple of options here. You've got four options, in fact. A, yes, diversifying my supplier base closer to demand market. B, yes, diversifying my supplier base to more Asian countries. C, yes, diversifying my supplier base to other regions. Or D, no. So is your company planning to diversify sourcing in the next 12 12 months in a sentence, or maybe two or three or four. Uh, what would be your response to I that? I think no is definitely a no-no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or should be rather a no-no. Uh, I would see more diversification uh, within uh, Asia and, and, and other regions, maybe balance that, that out a little bit. Okay, Para. Nisha, number, answer is choices A and B are the same because <laughs> <laughs> your market, yeah. the, the, supplying closer to your market is Asia. And that's one of the things that, again, we've known since before the trade war, really, which is that Western multinational companies want to be in Asia. With the U.S., for example, not joining the TPP, that didn't mean that corporate America, from General Motors to Google uh, and beyond, and, and uh, even um, you know aviation, automotive, across the board, were not planning on investing more and have been investing more. The the bottom line is, because I know you said one sentence, make where you sell. You know, I think this is widely agreed that this is the mantra. You have to yeah. make where you sell. Yeah. yeah, you've got a very funny definition of one sentence. <laughs> um, interestingly, look at that, D, no. And that is a great segue into us talking about how you tool up and whether you should be tooling up. What do you have to say to those who answered no? So I think, I think, Manisha, if uh, in the current context, right, with after the time, China US trade wars and protectionism and now COVID-19, which is unprecedented. If you're not thinking about diversification, I would be worried. I think you need to start thinking about diversification. Uh, you need to start thinking about diversification, not just from a geography perspective, but even within the same country within your supplier base, right? Um, so we have seen, we have, we have spoken to quite a few clients and I mentioned apparel and footwear, uh, but you can expand that to electronics, you can uh, expand that to commodities. We have seen actually proactively clients taking measures to diversify their base. So if, I feel like D is the Cupertino, California answer <laughs> because we know that you know Apple has doubled down again and again said you know we're going to continue to work in in China and again China it, it, the Apple example illustrates that indeed China has that you know magic formula in a way the factory towns that have specialized in their partnership with Foxconn in producing such a high output uh, of iPhones and, and iPads combined with the very large consumer market so they are making where they sell, so they would be right to answer no. But let's remember that Apple and others are looking very actively at Vietnam, Thailand, okay. other countries. They have now agreed in the last couple of years to expand their production assembly in India, for example. So even if they say no, they're also saying yes uh, yeah. in a different side of the house. If I well, could just I, add on to that, Manisha, yeah. is, you know, I, I, think, I think when you talk about setting up a completely new production line, depending on the type of industry, of course, it's a significant capital investment in many cases, 
Right. right. So if you already have an alternative supplier and you're ramping it up, that's a slightly different story. But wait, yes. I know Barak has a view on that. And before we go to that, I sure. did just want to say thank you to everyone who took part in the poll. I think it's very interesting that D got as much as, many as it words. did. Yeah. Now, do you think, before we move on to that next point and how much it costs to move to different sources, um, before we move there, do you think that that's reflective of the amount of uncertainty that's around at the moment? Yes. So when you are about to make uh, a big capital investment, uh, uncertainty does flip, play a factor in terms of business sentiments and therefore should I or should I wait and see. I think with the U.S. Uh, Sino trade war it, that had already started, unfortunately with COVID-19, um, that may to your point explain why at this point people are saying, okay, let's wait yeah. for this to be over. Okay, right. just hold that. So, Barak, earlier you had said that actually it's a surprise that people think that as a capital investment, it's, it's a huge investment to be shifting your sourcing. But actually you've argued to the contrary, haven't you? I've said that, you know, yes and no. Because historically, if you're in aviation, automotive, and so forth, these are very large fixed capital investments. And to some degree, they still are. Right. But does that mean that you don't already lay the groundwork for shifts towards what you, you know are going to be very large markets with, again, the lower labor costs? Uh, yes, you do make those shifts. And now you have these shocks mm -hmm. that compel you to diversify. So it's all of these things, all of these arguments do add up to something. Again, look at the previous shocks. I go back to the Sino-Japanese tensions over the rare earth mineral export ban. When China threatened to ban the export of rare earth minerals to uh, Japan in 2010, 2011. That led to a substantial diversion of Japanese FDI out of China within just a couple of years. They cut their FDI into China. And of course, Japan is one of the largest foreign investors in China by one third in a matter of a couple of years. So it is possible. And look at the uh, supply side in the sense of those, those poorer markets that are saying, come here, we're open for business, you'll get your special economic zones, your industrial parks, we have good IP protection, you know, uh, bring, your, bring your talent here, share with us, that kind of thing. That in tremendous competitiveness that is now out there across more markets than just China also creates greater incentives to shift as well. So it all adds up to a greater, again, the term that we agree is, is should be used here is the fungibility of investment is greater than before. Yep. Whereas the cost may be variable depending on the industry, but is it doable and is it affordable? The answer is yes. Okay, let's move on to technology. Mm -hmm. So this is a big one. This is yep. a big tool of the trade, pun intended, um, because you need to see more firms utilizing the extent of technology that we have at our fingertips today. Yeah, so, um, you know, you could rattle, I could go on and on about this one, right? Uh, everything from uh, AI to data to uh, supply chain platforms that are out there that can bring all these components together, give you the visibility. Um, 3D printing is, is an interesting one. So today I was reading something on um, a few small companies in the US and Europe starting to do 3D printing of masks, um, uh, surgical masks, to, to, to address the shortage. So I, th I think um, while we'll still see global supply chains, I think in certain, certain industries, certain sectors, you may see 3D printing solving a problem where you may not need to ship all that much across the high seas. You may actually 3D print it closer to the source in certain uh, industries like auto components and manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> What we have seen happen with um, the likes of BYD and Tesla, as I said in the opening, um, just shows that technology on the actual production line itself, mm -hmm. right, uh, is getting to a point of agility where you can actually rede redeploy it pretty quickly and, and, and people are getting nimble in terms of doing so. I think that will be interesting as we, as we look at this uh, in the rear view mirror in a few years from now, how people adopt this, because some of these emergency um, innovations uh, and fixtures may become a permanent fixture. Yep. Uh, in future. And again, you know, the automation of sub the, the, the digital visibility okay. into the supply chain footprint has really been strengthening in the last few years. Companies like Li and Fung, which is really the largest player in the world in this space, American tech companies like Flex that helps to manage the supply chains for some of the largest uh, multinationals. They have been really building the digital dashboards to help to identify both the kind of bottlenecks and risk areas, but also future opportunities and where, of course, sales, distribution, largest markets are. So we do have that digital capability to expand. And then in terms of the hardware side, as you mentioned, just one thing that I think is interesting, you're absolutely right about the 3D printing, right? The localization of that, even in, of course, very small countries like uh, Singapore, where that industry is growing. But the 3D printer itself, 
let's not forget, is not something that is deglobalized, sure. right? Think about the steel, uh, the plastics, uh, that those items in the cartridges that you're printing, all of it has a global supply chain. The supply chain as a supply chain yeah. is perhaps one of the most important lessons. To me, supply chains, you know, they really are the original World Wide Webs. Yeah. You know, and literally right down till you get to the, the resource level, right? You have to understand that everything has a supply chain. So even the 3D printer, as countries are saying, wow, we need to 3D print more, we need to deploy more 3D printers everywhere, it's like, oh, we have to import them. Yeah. yeah. Right. So never forget how global <laughs> uh, the supply chain truly is. Yeah, it's a very interesting point, right? I think it's all about what resources you have, what are your strengths, and how do you uh, feed that into the supply chain eventually to produce uh, yeah. some physical good, or in this case, yeah. an actual 3D yeah. printer. Yeah. 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 And this, uh, this also, by the way, you know, is indicative of why we need to think not just short term. Immediately, we're seeing that the, the struggle in the United States right now in the healthcare system to develop those those you know basic household or medical you know items that are needed that are relatively common but are in short supply but when you look at the longer term you think about north america in terms of manpower natural resources uh, you know fuel and energy industrial capability technology and capital there's no shortage of any of those things. So can you imagine North America genuinely learning uh, from this uh, crisis and bouncing back and reindustrializing with you know, rational, pragmatic, long-term oriented governments? We're not gonna go into too much on that, but absolutely it's possible for North America as it is for Europe too. But that raises a really good point, is how do you get governments to leverage that? Forget governments actually, companies, mm -hmm. the clients that you have, how do you, get that going? How do you make that happen? Because there are many, and just, just from the result of our poll, we're getting that sense that perhaps we are, and like I said in the introduction, we're at that inflection point where we need to think about it, but we need to think about, okay, but how do I do this? Mm. There must be managers out there thinking that right now. Right, absolutely, Manisha. And I, I think it's a question, uh, if, you, if you talk about companies, countries are a slightly different ballgame with politics and um, leadership issues. But I would say at the company level, it's whether you're treating the supply chain as a BAU procurement cost and efficiency function, or you really see it as a key differentiator um, in terms of being a business, a strategic business differentiator, right? And that will then drive, uh, you know, am I going to diversify? Am I going to... Uh, build a very agile supply chain that's going to help me compete in a slightly different way. How does it tie into my business strategy? If I'm a supermarket, am I only big and mortar? Or am I going to have a huge push into the e-commerce and online marketplace that's going to then drive a slightly different kind of supply chain in terms of how I then deliver the last mile to people's houses as opposed to waiting for um, you know, footfall in my store. So it's not just about the supply, it's also the fulfillment and the delivery on the on the buy side of it. And it's also about the infrastructure. So one of the big big things everyone's talking about now is 5G, right? Yeah. It's all very well to talk about 5G, but do you even have the systems that can work with yeah. 5G? That's yeah. a whole different ball game, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're a, a multinational and you're still dealing with IT legacy systems, mm. first of all, how do you embrace this new technology? How would you use AI to know where everything in your supply chain was actually standing at any one point in time? When are we going to get to that stage? Yeah, so look, I think um, most organizations that have been around for the last 20, 30, 50 years struggle with uh, obsolescence in technology, and banks are no uh, exceptions. Uh, so, but there, the good thing is there's technology available to put, put wrappers around this. So you could have a beautiful skin uh, uh, where, where, you know, on top of something where the engine underneath is actually quite old, but it looks and behaves and feels as if it is as pretty new. Uh, you have third-party providers that are providing platforms that can plug into your old systems and bring all of that information together uh, for, to give you that visibility in terms of your supply performance, yeah. uh, cost, etc. Well, so I, it, it's yeah. possible. Sorry. I have to say I'm quite optimistic yeah, about I'm this obviously area. I'm a skeptic. <laughs> no, no, no. The reason being that unlike other areas of public infrastructure investment, when you think about uh, you know transportation infrastructure, energy, when it comes to digital technology, you have enormous public and private capital going mm. into it, and a real symbiosis. You not only have the countries that have national strategies around 5G, obviously uh, China, Japan, uh, South Korea, and IoT sensor networks. Japan, big strategy. 
the cost of those technologies going way down. The business model making it very appealing to want to sell those technologies broadly to the Southeast Asian, yep. to the poor or governments. So the leapfrogging effect is well underway. I mean, Manisha, your question is not hypothetical, basically. This is already happening. This is why, again, you see rapid deployment. And then in terms of the last mile for supply chain delivery, the ecosystems are flourishing. The fastest growing, hottest startups in Southeast Asia and in India are all about these supply chain issues. So you're seeing taking the global technology and you know platforms, applying them to the local context, and fixing those logistical bottlenecks through these technologies that are cheap, that's already been happening for five years. That's why this region is growing uh, so well. So is that going to accelerate on the back uh, of this? Absolutely, it will. Clarag, what would you say, because obviously you're talking to all the movers and shakers and you know what's hot, um, what would you say is the most exciting development that will help in supply chain management? The most exciting thing is going to have to be the is is just the sort of full awareness. I think I think it really is the awareness, and and because what that helps people to visualize is uh, where they're over concentrated, and that's a critical thing. And then and also these are not just quantitative in terms of where uh, where production is and so forth. It also has become more political. So you're seeing uh, technologies, you know, AI based that are social context based, reading social media, looking at political developments, and able to inform decision makers about what potential risks are in the political environment, in obviously the, the, the health uh, system and so forth, uh, maybe you know, civil unrest, and then to plot, anticipate, and shift accordingly. So this anticipatory technologies, Are you, you talking will, about AI? Uh, partially it is, you know, AI is playing a role, machine learning is playing a role, but just being able to integrate broader data sets that are qualitative and real time and not just quantitative and internal to the supply chain, that is begun to happen. There's a lot of good companies that are doing that right now. It's not that difficult to broaden these technologies as they get better and better and they learn from doing more, as you well know. That is really what drives machine learning in the first place. So again, an area where I am fairly optimistic that again, more leaders will, after each crisis, we know we learn. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take this more seriously and therefore respond uh, as we should. Okay, unfortunately, we will have to wrap up soon. But before we do, we can still talk about a few more things, rest assured. <laughs> and one of the things I want to do is just um, get us up to date on our last poll, which is uh, the question is, which one, which one of these technologies is the most relevant to your business to improve your supply chain resilience? We talked about resilience earlier. Is it A, AI and machine learning base? Is it B, 3D printing to move production closer to biolocation? We talked about that. Mm -hmm. C, big data and predictive analytics. D, cloud-based platform to collaborate with your trading partners or E, others. So we'll just give that some time to breathe uh, before we look at the results of that poll. There you go. Wow. I think that's pretty unequivocal, <laughs> don't wow. you? Yeah. Oh, no, no, don't answer. That was just, I mean, that's pretty much what you were just saying, right? Again, it's, I, I, if I could change E to all of the above instead of others, that would be my answer. All of these are so yeah. absolutely essential. They're all technological in one way, shape, or form, whether it's the digital side or the manufacturing side, additive manufacturing, and so forth. But they do go hand in hand, right? You know, because the Internet of Things and the Fourth Industrial Revolution are all about using technologies to optimize production physically, but then gathering that data and analyzing and making sure that you are um, you know, uh, um, having as, as optimal output and production as possible and, and, and you know, thinking about the geography of yeah. it. So all of these things actually feed and reinforce each other. You don't want to neglect any of these, even though no one appears to be voting for B. There we go, <laughs> yes. Yeah, didn't get any votes at all. Okay, um, we will be wrapping up soon, like I said. And I know one of the things, Sam, that you were quite keen to talk about, uh, and it's actually come in as a question, is what is your view on the impact of renewable energy, uh, solar uh, energy in particular, su in supply chain and logistics? So just a brief one on that if you could. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, so given where oil price is, I think, I think there will be a natural tendency for many counterparties uh, and countries that are net importers of oil to gravitate towards, let's take the cheap oil and feed, feed it to our input sources and we'll use it. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, many countries, many clients have uh, signed up for UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's a big agenda. Um, the youth of the world um, are, are up in arms uh, about green and clean. So I think what the other extreme you would see is actual, uh, actual double down on let's actually uh, you know, put more effort in terms of clean and green and sustainable, whether it's solar or whether it's fuel cell and, and so on. So I think there'll be two diametrically opposing forces. Uh, it could go either way. You'll, uh, my guess is you'll see a bit of both. 
you'll see the large oil importing nations, India is an example. Uh, this helps the import bills and balance of payment situations, continue the import. At the same time, I don't see um, uh, countries that have signed up with a longer term plan. So in the short term, you may see a bit of that, but uh, countries and counterparties that have signed up for uh, sustainable, development, uh, sustainable development growth um, actually double down on investments in clean and green. Okay. I'll just add one point. You know, sure. there, there is clearly now a psychological, which you described, and a financial decoupling of the idea that clean energy to be justified depends on low oil prices, mm -hmm. right? So we invite, you know, now you have a situation where even though oil is low, clearly we know that the cost of solar installation and so forth is quite competitive. So we know that we're going to, the train has left the station on that. Yeah. And it's better to have both and, in the name of resilience, yeah. right? It's better to have both and than to continue in this either or kind of fashion. Okay, you've got 50 seconds. I want you each to give me your, what you think is the biggest opportunity coming out of the stage that we are in right now in terms of supply chain disruption, Sam. I think my, if I were to take, pick up one item, I think it would be about having visibility deep in your chain and starting to think, think about diversifying and resilience. Okay, Parag. Definitely bringing down regional barriers, intra-regional barriers. We have a long way to go in Asian countries uh, benefiting from each other's complementarities, their competitive advantage in various uh, economic sectors, production sectors. There's still a lot of bottlenecks and inefficiency at borders uh, across Asia, and the trade agreements have not yet ironed those out. So bring down the borders. He has a, he has a very long idea for Lex <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> The academic can help it. It's been great in terms of timing. I've been told to wrap, so I just want to leave enough time for me to say thank you, Sam. Uh, Samuel Matthew, thank you so much for that. Uh, Head of Documentary Trade at Standard Chartered Bank and Parag Khanna, who is the author of The Future is Asian and Connectography. Check those books out. Thank you so much thank as well for your opinions today. And thank you to all of you for joining us for this live telecast. It's also going to be recorded, so you can check it out on various channels. Do give us your feedback. There is an icon at the bottom of the page. I'm Anisha Tank signing off on behalf of Standard Chartered.